Hey folks, welcome back to Connected, the Connected Classroom. My name is Rusty May. Uh, we come here every week to give educators an opportunity to talk about what's on their mind and what's going on with them. So I'm a school counselor. I've been doing distance education for about the last 17 years. And uh, ever since the pandemic hit, we've been doing this show every week to, again, give educators an opportunity to talk a little bit about what's going on with them. So let's join our Fred Tenny, Teddy, see if he's there today, see what's going on in New York. How you doing, Teddy? Hey, Rusty. Good day, everyone. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. What's going on? Um, so I got tested for the first time last week for COVID. Pretty easy. They did the saliva swab where you pretty much um, put the swab in between your, your gums underneath your tongue. And it was pretty much a quick, easy test. But overall, um, we are seeing a surge of cases in various states, and I'm not sure what the outcome may be down the road, but with the weather starting to change in the northeast part of the country, and a lot of people pretty much taking a political stand in terms of COVID, it, it will make it harder for many schools to complete their semester this fall. I heard some of the uh, colleges in your system had uh, seen some real rise in cases. Yeah, so prior to, um, I think our last meeting a couple of weeks ago, there were surges in several universities and they had to go back remote for a couple of weeks, but eventually they felt it was best to just go remote for the rest of the semester. And it's not any fault of their own. Um, a lot of the places, if you look at the demographic or the communities, there were surges of cases within public areas, so bars, pubs, um, anywhere that had crowds that tried to socially distance, but unfortunately folks were just coming in and out. And with the lack of testing, it made it hard for them to find out where these um, cases were coming from, yet alone how to contain them. So in the interest of the students, they felt it was best to just close the school down for a couple of weeks and then later go remote. But yeah, there were a lot of cases in several universities across um, upstate New York. What's happening with the uh, the tuition and stuff like that? Are they still charging for the housing? Are the kids being kept in the dorms? Or are they going home? So I spoke to a student of mine yesterday. We had a meeting and she had brought up to me that they are actually having students request for a refund. Now it's in two forms. You can either request a refund for your tuition or a refund for your meal plan. Now, I'm not sure how likely each student will get that request accepted. I think at this point with most students going back home for Thanksgiving and likely not returning back, how likely is the university going to give back that money to the students? So there is a protocol in place to seek a refund, but then again, it may be on a um, first come first base service, or you may have to prove and give a substantial reason as to why you need that refund. And you talk about the political uh, aspect of the masks. What are you seeing in that regard on your campus? Well, where I work at, at SUNY Geneseo, the students are very vigilant when it comes to wearing their masks. They, I haven't had any issues since I came back to work in regards to patrons not wearing their masks, requesting books or items. But across the country, it's a different story. There's situations where students may be naive and I think part of it is students are listening to adults who are making a political stance about it. And on top of that, the people who have control and who have a larger say in regards to wearing face masks are giving mixed messages. So not that political party affiliation matters here, but it's really about just common sense, in my opinion. If you know that based on scientific evidence that face covering, face masks, reduces the spread or the transmission of diseases, wouldn't it be wise to wear one, but instead to make a political issue and say, well, I don't want to wear it because of X, Y, Z. I understand, and you have brought this in the past, that fatigue has, start, has started to kick in, or if not, has pretty much kicked in in regards to folks refusing to wear their masks, which I understand, but at the same time, the mask is working, and it's sad that a lot of folks refuse to wear their mask, but yet want to get COVID tested. And we all know that testing has become a premium at this point. It's not 
in the masses anymore. It's it's limited now, and the face covering will save lives, and social distance will save lives. But the other concern that I'm having now is, you know, with Thanksgiving around the corner, even Halloween being next weekend, and Christmas down the road is, would this cause another surge? We already have one now as we speak, but there are other events moving forward, and we've seen what happened with Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, how those, how states who thought they may not see a surge ended up seeing one. And now that we have one now, it's, we're at a breaking point to say the least. Right. Hi, Joanne. Thank you for joining us today. Are you an educator? Yes. Where do you work? Yes, I am. Where do you work? Sorry about that. Um, I work in Nassau and Suffolk County on Long Island, and I'm, uh, I'm an assistant technology specialist. And this has definitely been a very challenging time for me because there's no set time when I see my students. Right. And they're only in on a hybrid model. So it's very, very difficult to try to find the time to see them. What are some of the challenges? I mean, obviously not being able to see them, but what are some of the other challenges that you're facing? Well, I find that the teachers are definitely overwhelmed in the classroom um, and they, they don't want to have the students be pulled out. They're willing to have me come into the classroom, which I usually do anyway, but the, the response to the emails, I have to, email, I have to email several, several times to certain teachers. It's really been very rough this year. Teddy, what are you seeing in your staff um, in, in your college about uh, how they're reacting to everything that's going on? So I think what I've noticed is staff who come to campus to work don't have an issue with coming to work. It's just the issue of what they can't control. If you have a family and your child all of a sudden goes to class that has to go remote, how do you handle that? How do you make sure that my child is taken care of while knowing that I may, I may have to work remotely one week. I may have to go to campus to teach one week. I may have to travel. I may have to attend a rent. I may have to conduct a Zoom meeting. It's a lot of issues that unfortunately they're not able to control. And I think with the semester coming to an end soon, people are concerned, well, what does that leave, what, what does that leave me come my next contract? Am I going to get a contract renewal? Am I going to be told that I need to, that I'm going to have to leave this job? Um, I've seen already a lot of adjunct professors leave before the start of the fall semester, but now where does that leave faculty and staff? And during my union meetings, we're, we're seeing these dialogues being held, but there hasn't been much progress yet to leave folks with some sort of sense of comfort and knowing that things are going to be okay. Yeah, I don't think anybody can give that promise right now. Joanne, what's going on with your staff? How are they reacting? Um, they're under a lot of pressure as well from <clears throat> just like exactly what you just spoke about. Because um, they, some of them are teachers themselves and have students so when the students have a remote learning day, they have to either, they, they don't have childcare, so they have to then call in sick or uh, to use their vacation days. And it's very stressful for everybody. That's the only word I could say is that it's very stressful for everyone. What are you hearing from the administration in terms of what they're trying to do to, to minimize this or to try to help the faculty? Well, the last I heard, they were thinking about having all the students come back in, starting with the elementary school students, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, but basically, I mean, everybody has a Chromebook, so that was one thing that they hustled with, and, and they really uh, provide for every student. And I think there's about 5,000 students that I have in one school district. Um, but that's basically it. <laughs> Well, we were just reading some research today from Europe um, saying that in major uh, studies that were done in Germany and Norway um, and a couple other countries as well, that they don't uh, 
see that schools are uh, super spreaders, especially elementary schools and the higher up you go. So I think they're going to start moving in that direction. At least hopefully they'll start following the research and say that kids really aren't at risk as much as that. But to go to, to Teddy's point, though, you know, what does a teacher do if their student, if they have a kid that's in school and that kid has to stay home? Um, there isn't any effort right now to try to assist teachers. Uh, they're just having to use their uh, either call in sick or take a day off. Is there any anything going on to try to help teachers deal with that conundrum? Uh, not that I've heard of. How about you, Teddy? Anything going on with the colleges and helping the teachers out in those situations? No, I think the best thing I've heard is in regards to, I guess, when you're traveling. So right now, or as of yesterday, New York State's travel advisory, um, the travel advisory currently has 41 states, which now includes New Jersey and Connecticut, which is part of the tri-state area if you add New York. And if you go to any of the states, you have to quarantine or self-isolate for two weeks. So if you were to travel there and you come back, you can isolate for two weeks without having to use your sick day or vacation. But a lot of folks are trying not to travel. And I guess the issue is now, well, what is that going to do if I still have to take care of my child or I still have something to do that does not pertain to traveling? Can I still take these days off? And a lot of people just aren't sure what to do at this point. It's a matter of, do I isolate myself because I might have been exposed or do I just try to continue moving on? And I know a couple months ago, one of my colleagues happened to go to Chicago and she had to isolate for two weeks because it was part of the travel advisory at that time. And even now with so many states, it's just hard to trust people and say, okay, if I know I'm going to go here, I'm going to come back and just isolate, but rather they might just go back to work because they don't have any symptoms. So what are the major concerns that you have personally, Joanne, in terms of what's going on now with all this stuff that's happening around? What, what are you thinking about as, as we come up on the election and we come up on, you know, obviously we talked about the, uh, the idea that the surge is coming back and so forth. What are the personal issues that are really concerning you right now? Um, the fact that uh, one, that mask wearing is a political um, issue, which it shouldn't be. Um, also just that I feel that the students are not getting their education this year. They're doing the best they can. Everyone's doing the best they can. <clears throat> But I just don't feel that they're going to be um, excelling this year. When you think about that, though, in terms of the, the economic fallout from all of this, and I, I have no sense that we're, we're even close to understanding what the economic ramifications of this are going to be. Uh, kids being in a hurry to keep moving forward and to continue on the normal trajectory of education um, in terms of graduating from high school and going to college and so forth. I mean, it it doesn't seem to me, I don't know what you think, but it doesn't seem to me like that trajectory is still there. It doesn't, it seems to me like the whole economy and everything else is going to take a step back for an extended period of time. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, on that part of it? For me, I, I still see uh, <clears throat> 11th grade students still working hard, trying to think about what college they're going to go, get into. Um, I still see, I don't see a shift yet of that. Uh, it probably will happen, but I still see right now that these students are still trying to get into their colleges. I also feel that um, what really should, I think what should happen is there should be really more project-based um, work for these students. I mean, they are sitting in front of a computer all day long and each, even though they don't have as much homework this, as they usually do, they're still in front of that computer all day long. And I just feel that instead of having, you know, someone come on for art and, and, and um, phys ed and that they should do some kind of, they should do projects so that they can con condense their time on the computer and do more, a little bit more creative work and have that handed in. I, I just feel that it's too much for them. 
on the computer all day long. And I, and I am I, in assistive technology. I, I love the computer. I think it's wonderful, but I just think it's just too much for them. There's been a lot of writing recently about taking more personal responsibility for our educational pathway. And it sounds kind of like what you're talking about, giving students the option to really learn at their own pace and to, you know, create a project, how they respond to information, how they, you know, give feedback, whether it's video or they do a podcast or they do something like that. It, it seems like an amazing yes. opportunity to give kids back their educational um, kind of their kind of take control but you're not seeing that with your teachers or is it the administration that's saying they have to be online all day uh, that's just the the rules basically yeah i think it's the administration that this is what needs to be done are they worried at all about ada are they worried about whether the average daily attendance are they trying to keep track of that is that going to become an issue going forward in turn because i know teddy has talked about the college situation and, and they, they could be coming up to a huge financial problem. But from a public education standpoint, has there been any discussion about that in terms of how many kids are showing up online or is, is the money going to, how is that going to work out? Do you have any sense of that? Well, this year is much better than last March because there was no consequences, even though there really aren't any consequences. I think the parents are uh, much more, uh, with the program come September than they were in March. A lot of students did not show up in March. But um, <clears throat> they take attendance. And so if you, the student is on at all, even if they're on for the last five minutes, because I've been hearing that they do that in high school, sometimes they'll come on for the last five minutes. They're still uh, marked present. And there's no distinction between whether they're online or whether they are in the classroom. Hmm. they're That's present gonna... so <laughs> they'll probably still get the funding okay we just had a new join us odiva odivu are you there would you like to say hello We're just having a conversation about what's going on in the classroom are you let's see get her to join us all right we would love to talk to you there you are are you there hi 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 I'm from Romania, and uh, all of us are uh, in the same situation. And I'm eager to heard more about your experience at uh, online uh, teaching online. Okay. Well, Joanne, can you speak to that real quick about what how, how are your teachers reacting to try to to, to this new experience? How are they? Uh, dealing with the, the switch to online? Well, I think they're doing a great job. They're really working hard, um, but it's just very stressful. Um, they are, they, what they're doing is they have, um, so for the elementary school, it's an A and a B day. So the students are home for one of the days and then they come in the next day. And so the rest of the students are on um, online and the teacher, uh, uses Google Classroom, the teachers use Google Classroom and they, they push out all the uh, documents for the students to work on. Then in the middle school and the high school, it's A through D. So the, some of the high school students don't come in until like one day a week on one week or two days a week on the next week. And the rest is online. Um, and, but basically the, the teachers have been prepared and um, you know, they, I think they're doing a great job. Great. Uh, Michael Fisher, thank you for joining us. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Michael Fisher, and it's a pleasure being here. I um, was principal in New York City for many years. I started in education in 1966. I'm presently uh, developed a program called Reach to Teach, which is an anti violence, anti bullying program, and they have very strong feelings about systemic racism and classism in our school systems. And I'm working very hard to develop a program in which I can get other educators to support me and how we could integrate the schools in a very systematic way so that we could deal with these uh, systemic problems. That's interesting. I know that we've had so much going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and so forth right now. Are you seeing that the schools are more receptive to the work that you're doing? 
seems like all the schools that I've been working in have been receptive to what I'm doing. Problem is that the uh, schools that are structured today are very segregated. And most people that I've spoken to throughout the country, wherever I meet them, they say the same things. You have your good schools and your bad schools. And your good schools are always the schools that are usually consisted of the parents who know how to get their kids into those schools. Number one, they're politically or so connected, as well as the, the youngsters who come from more middle class to uh, more affluent situations and the kids in the poorer sections of the city, bright kids, kids that you know have the potential to be anybody they want to be. But the reality is that there's no amount of money that the state, federal government, local governments can give a school that compared to how much money is brought into those so-called better schools to provide the kinds of enrichment programs that the youngsters need, the after school programs that they need, and the kind of caring for them that, that unfortunately is often deprived. Uh, the parents that are the youngsters in the schools that I work in, they feel the way I feel, that their kids are stuck and they can't get out of that mired situation. So. Uh, I'm working very closely with parents and tr trying to uh, deal with these problems and get their perspective. They're willing to bust their kids cross town to get their kids into a better school, but they don't have the connections and the wherewithal to be able to do it. And it's unfortunate that the state labels schools successful and unsuccessful. In fact, in New York, they'd actually call these schools failing schools right. at one point. So uh, it's very sad and uh, it hurts me when I, uh, hear the concerns of uh, parents and I see what the teachers are saying and I, I believe them. It's not necessarily that the teachers don't want to teach or are unable to teach. It's that they don't feel like they have the resources and when the kids go home, they don't get the support so often because the parents are working all day. And the pandemic has just been impossible for the kids of those unfortunate situations to be able to cope with. Even though they're being given iPads, Many of the parents don't have the technology, the skills to be able to support their youngsters. And um, it's, just, it's just so sad to see what's going on. Well, my concern is, and this is something we've talked about on this show before, and Teddy, you can chime in here as well, and Joanne, um, is, is that with public education being pushed as hard as it's being pushed in the pandemic right now, and so many of the affluent parents choosing to send their kids to different schools, whether it be charter schools, or create learning pods mm -hmm. or hire individual tutors or whatever it happens to be, that public education in my mind, and it also with, we're looking at a significant um, reduction in the teacher staff because we're, we, we could very well by the end of this year, lose upward to 20 to 30 teachers, 20 to 30% of teachers who could retire early, which means that the public education system will then just be a place where kids go who don't have any other choices. And that's my concern. I don't know, Teddy, we talked about this before. What, do you, what are your thoughts about that in terms of the public education system just becoming the, the place for only kids who don't have any options? I, I totally agree with you. I think it really comes down to the financial status of the parents. Um, if you're... Uh, Yes, they are. If you live in a low poverty area and you're dealing with the pandemic, if you don't have a tight knit group of um, neighbors, relatives, friends, or a community that stays close together and can form a pod, it makes it easier for you. And it's already hard enough that the pandemic has taken away jobs from many individuals, but now you're at a point where you have to juggle between you know, being unemployed while making sure your child gets a fair education. And we may not see the ramifications now, but five years down the road, what Joanne was saying, you know, these kids who are applying for college can even afford to go to college at some point. Would they even be financial aid available? Do they now have to look at their other options? You know, do I go to community college for two years before going to a university? Do I take a gap year? There's a lot of things that we're not looking at right now because we're still trying to cope with the pandemic. But down the road, you know, those who are in grade school, what happens when they get to high school? Do they now have an issue where they're not on the same reading level as somebody who might have had the pod and was able to excel or at least right. gain advantage? So 
there's a lot of things that we really have to look at. It may, it may, it may not be, it may be hard to look at it now, but five years from now, we really have to assess what this pandemic did to the future of education. Well, Vidu, I would love for you to join our conversation if you'd like to. Joanne, what, what are your thoughts about that in terms of public education becoming, you know, a, a basically a place for kids that don't have options? Yeah, that would be a shame. I, uh, but I think that is something to think about for the near future. It does look like that's what, how it might turn out. Are you seeing, are you hearing at all from your staff uh, in the schools that you're working with that there are people who are considering retiring early because of the situation being so difficult? Uh, I haven't heard that. No, I haven't okay. heard. You know, the people Good. need their jobs. That's the way they 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 feel right now. Okay. Which means that our real problem. Yeah, my name is Juana Krihana. Hana. Good. Okay. okay. Um, this is a real problem in uh, in my town because uh, a lot of my colleagues are uh, thinking to uh, retire. Uh, they are all old, and um, COVID uh, is a problem for uh, for them. Okay. Um, in fact, the real problem in our school are to, um, the real problem is to motivate the students because they are coming to school uh, just uh, one week and the other they are staying at home, working online. And uh, when they are coming at school in this week, uh, they consider to come at school after a big holiday because the online school uh, in their mind is a holiday. Right. Even if we are trying very hard to uh, learn about uh, many, many apps uh, to work. Um, I teach Romania. It's a very uh, important um, object. Um, I'm working hard to develop uh, some uh, virtual uh, apps and uh, virtual reality apps and augmented reality apps oh, in, wow. order, in order to uh, make uh, them more interested about my object. Um, my whole hour, it's a very big uh, playing area, but... Uh, no, our government doesn't help us very much. Um, I see that is a common problem. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm scared about my future. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And I think that oftentimes what's happening right now is that young people don't believe um, that the future looks that bright. I think a lot of kids right now are kind of checked out because they're seeing what's happening and the, the different challenges. Michael, what are, you, what are you hearing from the kids? Are you feeling like they're checked out a bit? Most of the youngsters that I'm working with, especially the middle school students, I'd say that it's really hard to really gauge, but they're like playing the game the best they can. Right. When they're at home, they find they get distracted too easily. And when they're in school, they're just happy to see their peers. And it's become uh, like a social gathering, even though they're separated in, in the classrooms and whatnot. It's certainly not the same. And uh, they don't consider it a real learning experience the way it obviously would be for school where it was. But the home experience, unless they are the most motivated of youngsters, um, the kids who are really not that motivated when they do homework or do anything at home are the ones who are really suffering the most right now because uh, it's a waste of their time. That's what yeah. I'm being told. I'm being truthful. It sounds exactly what Han is dealing with. I don't think there's anything different between Romania and New York City and any other place in the world. All these kids right now are looking at all the situations around them and they're listening to the the challenges that are going on and they're just kind of like, who cares? You know, what difference does it make? Joanne, what do you, what are you hearing from your kids? Um, are you feeling like your kids are, you were saying that a lot of the 11th graders are still motivated trying to get into the college of their choice. Uh, do you work with younger kids as well? Do you get a sense yes. of malaise? Um, in, I, the, the, 
Not really. Uh, the elementary Good. school kids, they're okay. They, you know, again, they, they come in and it is a social experience for them. They are very happy coming into school. Um, I also find actually some of the high school students that are, have social issues that they are very happy at home and they, yeah. they're starting to be a little bit more successful, which was very surprising to me. Um, they prefer to be at home and work on the computer and just be isolated. Um, but the, the younger kids are fine. Um, they just, like I said, they just like to come into school, the younger ones, middle school. I don't see a problem either. They, they, um, they're, they, they're fine. They, they're coming into school when they need to, and then they are at home doing their work. Now, the socioeconomic situation in the schools that you work in is upper middle class? Well, it's very interesting. I work in a, an upper middle class school, but the one that I'm talking about is not, uh, it's, uh, no, it's not upper middle class. Okay. That's exciting. Yeah. And yeah. we are here. We are hearing that from more and more teachers who are talking about the fact that, that ki you know, the disenfranchised kids who didn't like school because of the social pressures associated with it are doing excelling amazingly online. And so there's going to be a lot of positive that comes out of this in terms of, you know, a hybrid model being, you know, very workable and so forth. The problem that we have in the United States is, is that it's become a daycare system so that parents can go to work. And until we answer that question, and I don't know how it works in Romania, Hannah, but in the United States, for example, our public school system is basically our daycare system. So once a kid turns six, you can dump your kid off at school and you can leave them there almost, you know, from seven o'clock in the morning until I don't even know five or six o'clock at night they're feeding them two meals a day and so forth so it's become a much bigger thing than just the public education system I don't what's it like in Romania Hannah no it's not our case uh, the um, people go to school uh, about five six or seven uh, hours without uh, having uh, any meal um, wow so um, uh, there are some private schools um, where the, they uh, receive uh, some meals, but in public schools, uh, no, uh, no food. How old are these kids? Uh, my, uh, my middle ages, between uh, 10 and uh, 14. Wow. Uh, yeah, 14. That's, that's fascinating. Teddy, what are you hearing from the students on the campus? I know you talk to a lot of the kids that come into your library and stuff. Are they, are they feeling confident? Are they feeling like things are going to move forward? How are they feeling? I think optimistic is the word when I talk to my students. A lot of them are a year or two away from graduating, but they're really focused on just trying to finish the semester. And I think when the university announced that we're, they were going to um, have the option to not return after Thanksgiving, it was a sign of relief for them because they knew that at least they can be at home, finish the semester, and then focus on the spring semester. Mm -hmm. But next semester, I think, is where I may start to see concerns because that'll be, you know, it's towards the completion of the academic year. So what happens by then? Obviously, things are going to change nationally across the country by the end of this year. But by next semester, financially, you know, can one of my students be able to come back prior to the pandemic or at least prior to you know the restart for, from the school that I work at a lot of students have already made the mindset that they're not coming back they rather do their classes remotely others just took a semester off so now if the spring semester kicks in would these same students I'm talking to now would they come back that's my concern I don't know their financial situation but would their parents be able to afford tuition would they able to afford room and board would they able to afford just being a college student, knowing that you have to buy books, you have to eat. Um, yes, you will have a job since you do work at the university, but everything that we can't control, how does that affect them? So that's really my concern. Okay, uh, Michael, I would really appreciate it if you'd send me some information about the program that you're talking about. I, I do uh, daily videos for kids that I've been doing for the last 17 years talking about, you know, things like what you're talking about, not as much about the uh, 
the integration issue and, and, and about, uh, you know, uh, systemic racism and so forth. But I would love to see your resources and see um, what you're doing out there. Maybe I can share it with some of my teachers as well, because I know that when people are, are starting to wrap their head around this more and, and really understanding the differences and, and trying to teach kids how to to understand race and to talk about race and to begin to, to have an open conversation about this. So please, if you can send it to me in the chat, maybe you can send me a, your, your website or wherever I can get more information. I'd really appreciate it. Um, we're coming up on our 40 minute mark. So I wanna give everybody an opportunity for kind of a final comment. We have a lot of people that watch the show and recording um, as part of the, the uh, emergency uh, uh, learning summit that is being put on by learning revolution. So some positive thoughts to kind of end the day. Um, Joanne, some positive thoughts from you in terms of what you're seeing. I know you said, it sounds like you're, you guys are killing it. You know, it sounds like your teachers are doing great and your students are motivated and everything else. Anything, any positives that you want to leave our audience with? Um, no, I think you summed it up. <laughs> Yeah, well, congratulations. It's really fantastic that, uh, and obviously you're a big part of that. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. Teddy? Thank you. Yes, I guess I want to end up by saying that we should keep this conversation going, right? they be here amongst our fellow coworkers, staff members, but we're not going to have the solutions to all the problems, but at least finding ways to handle them. I think it definitely helps a lot. And I know personally coming to these weekly episodes with you and talking to you and talking to other um, individuals definitely help me have a better outlook in terms of what's going on. But, you know, just get a sense of how other people are feeling and at least come to some solution or ways of, you know, positive outcomes. So I think my, what I want to say is to keep the conversation going. And yeah, and please do invite people to, you know, we were, when Teddy and I started this, we had maybe 20 to 25 educators coming on and talking about what their issues were and so forth. And this is not a place to solve problems. This is just kind of a place to share information and to, to kind of let some, you know, let, let some of your thoughts and feelings go. It's a safe space to talk and, and to share your thoughts. So if you've got other people who are interested, please invite them. We're here every week at the same time. So Michael, any final thoughts? Well, I want to thank you for this experience. I'm a new member of a learning revolution, and it's something in which uh, I'm looking for people who are like-minded throughout the country or the world, for that matter, get their perspectives on things. And uh, I found these this half hour to be very interesting. All right, I'm going to send you my email address. So it's in the chat right now, rusty at schooltoolstv.com. Send me some information about what you're doing, and I'll try to get it out to other people who are doing what you're doing as well. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks for all of you that are watching or listening to the podcast after the fact. This is the Connected Classroom. I'm Rusty May. Um, and again, thank you for the work you're doing. You're the boots on the ground, and you're touching the future. Look forward to seeing you next week. Um, have a fantastic day.